Good morning, good afternoon and good evening from wherever you're sitting across the globe. My name is Sharon Morris. I'm General Manager of SIPS Australia and New Zealand and I'm your host today. The theme, Building a Strategy for Tomorrow, 10 Megatrends for the Supply Chain Managers. We have over 300 registered attendees today, so why don't you raise your hand and let us know you're out there. Terrific. For all those of you who are participating for the first time, I say welcome. And for those of us who are joining us again, welcome back. And to everyone, thank you for joining us today. We're really glad to see you. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional land of the of traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, and that is all the lands on which we meet today. And I'd also like to pay my respects to elders both past and present. For those of us you out there who don't know the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply, that is SIPS, we're your global professional body for procurement and supply professionals. We're your professional partner for life. We're here to support you through your professional journey. And with that support comes knowledge. And today's webinar is a really good way of showing that example of sharing knowledge. And there are so many other avenues that SIPS can offer to get information and content, particularly on the SIPS webpage. As a member of SIPS, you are a trusted professional. You've passed the highest procurement standards, codes of ethics and codes of conduct. And we're here to ensure that you are successful and you are in demand. And research tells us that MSIPS and FSIPS mean something to employees and it's more likely to earn you 21% more. But most importantly, SIPS is your gateway to connections. And we're really about networking and being part of a procurement community. So right now, there's never been a better time to be that have virtual connections. And we're really seeing some great examples of our global um, community connecting. You're all connecting out there today and sharing ideas and advice. So now more than ever, let's support each other. Let's stay connected and keep the conversation going. I recommend you having a look at the LinkedIn groups, SIPS LinkedIn groups, the SIPS ANZ, and there's also a global site, SIPS Connect and Engage. And today, by way of saying thank you for coming onto the webinar, uh, we're going to be offering a special member offer to Australia and New Zealand participants. And that is, if you sign up today until Monday the 27th of April, we'll waiver the joining fee. And that's valued at 120 Australian and New Zealand dollars. So all you have to pay, you only pay the annual membership fee subscription. Code and details are on the screen or you'll find it in our post-event survey that will be sent out following today's webinar. Before I introduce my colleague and friend, Bill Michaels, I want to remind you to use the chat button down below there. So make sure that you're saying hi to each other. But also, I want to remind you that we are going to have a Q&A at the end of this session. We're going to do 15 minutes of Q&A. So please put your questions and answers on into the question and answer section. Now, it's time to gauge what's going on out there and also to engage you guys. So I want to put out a poll for our webinar today and I want to know which part of the world are you from? Are you from Australia, New Zealand, Pacific Islands, Americas, Asia Pacific, Europe, North America, South America, Middle East or somewhere else? Please let us know. And the results are out. Look at that. We have a large percentage from Australia, followed by New Zealand. Great to see some friends from America. Might be you, Bill. Uh, Asia Pacific and also Europe and Middle East and some others. Welcome today. Thank you. We're also going to just do one more poll to see where you are with regards to procurement. Are you in procurement? Do you work directly in procurement, work indirectly in procurement, or have nothing to do with procurement, but just very interested in Bill's topic today?
And the results are 77% working directly in procurement and 22% in uh, indirectly. Great to have you on board and I'm sure you're going to get a lot of great information out of today's session. Thank you for participating. Now just a brief introduction about Bill Michaels, a fellow of our profession and Vice President of Operations in America and Canada for the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply. He is a recognised expert in sourcing and supply chain management. And Bill has worked in sourcing across a wide spectrum of industries and countries, transforming sourcing and the supply chain. Until recently, Bill was the CEO and founder of Ari Park Consulting, after more than 23 years at ADR North America. Under his leadership at ADR North, ADR North America became a leading niche specialty consulting form, firm and had won several recognitions and awards. I can tell you now, Bill is a sought after speaker, so we're very lucky to have him today. And he is also a writer with many publications, including a co-authorship of the book, Transform Your Supply Chain, and numerous published articles. In fact, he is now working on a new book focused on supplier relationship management. Bill has a BS in Business Administration from Rochester Institute of Technology and an MBA from Baldwin Wallace University. Bill is a SIPS Fellow and a Chartered Professional and has a CPSM and a CPM certifications. He is also on the Board of Directors of numerous boards, the Joe Nico Foundation, Editorial Board of Advisors for Supply and Demand Chain Executive Management and also an Advisory Board of the International Association of Data Quality Governance and Analytics. We are delighted to have Bill today. Bill, over to you. Thanks, Sharon. I really appreciate that introduction. Okay, so uh, what we're going to talk about today, I'm pleased to see so many people giving up their lunch uh, for this presentation. And uh, uh, if it helps, I'm, uh, I'm sitting in uh, early evening yesterday, so uh, uh, Australian time. Uh, so one of the things we want to do with this, this uh, agenda is really talk about a couple things. I want to look at the last decade and I want to look at procurement and see what has procurement done uh, over the last decade? What are the things we've done well? What are the things that we uh, could have done better? I also want to talk about uh, megatrends. So what's going to happen uh, in, in, in your, your field? that the first five megatrends are going to be directly related to procurement, direct, directly related to an impact that will impact you over the next five, five or so years. Uh, after that, we will talk about strategies for the future. We'll also talk about what do we do after the lockdown uh, is over. And then we'll entertain questions. <clears throat> you know, I've been around a long time, Sharon told you that I was in consulting for 20 years. I also had a long career as a practitioner. And uh, uh, some of the changes I've seen in my lifetime, you know, the, the first, the first uh, so picture of the classroom is me in second grade. And right now, everybody's sitting at home, working on their computers, whether they're in uh, uh, high school, college, grade school, um, that's a big change. You know, in my day, it was a Swiss watch. And today, I can do everything on my on my Apple Watch. And if we look at the transformation of the the, the iPhone and the dig, digital disruption that that brought, not only the phone industry, but it brought changes to our life, and the space program moving from calculators to typewriters to PCs. And I was in some of that transition. Uh, electric cars, you know, GPS—they're all big changes. Uh, and so this this is all about. What has changed, but really, what's going to change that's going to impact you? And how should you look at your skill set? And how should you change your direction if, if you want to be up to speed on some of the trends? Looking back over the last decade, a couple of things went really well. One of the things that went really well is that purchasing got recognized uh, as a vital function. And I think after uh, COVID-19, we're going to find that it's even going to become more valuable and a higher, uh, higher placement in the priority of corporate business. So we now have CPOs that are on the, uh, the C-suite. We also 
are really getting responsible for all the areas of expenditure and we're getting uh, expenditure under control. We've got the responsibility and the accountability and the authority for procurement. It's assigned to us now, we own it, and we have to make the best of it. Many organizations have really uh, strategies that are delivering year on year savings consistently. They're working very closely with suppliers. They're innovating, they're making changes, they're changing specs. And that's a positive note because it helps the bottom line of the company. But what we're gonna talk about is one of the trends a little bit later, which is really a focus, a defocus on price and an increased focus on value. You know, the other thing we've done is we built um, structures for a long time. The procurement structure was uh, that we were tactical, transactional, we focused on the operation, and we've really separated those activities. And biz our businesses and our organizations expect us to build strategies that are gonna take them to into the future and deliver year-on-year -year benefits. And then we've designed lots of supply networks and we're finding out that maybe we have to change them uh, after, after this pandemic, but we have designed very, very good uh, networks. But unfortunately, there are some things we didn't do so well and uh, kind of sunk the ship on. One, one of the things is everybody is focused on category management, building good category plans, building multi-year strategies, driving those categories uh, across global, uh, global plans and global operations. But very few companies, in, in my experience, in the consulting side, probably only about 5% of the companies were successful in building category plans that integrated the business plan into the, into the supply chain and drove uh, successful strategies. In fact, uh, one of the thinking, one of the, some of the thinking about short-term short -term earnings and cost reduction have really kind of impacted the benefits we can get from category management uh, programs. So we, we haven't really capitalized on all the opportunities from category management. We've talked a lot about moving away from a functional approach to a fully integrated cross-functional business category approach, but we're not there yet. And we still take a short-term approach, probably driven by uh, quarterly earnings and, and, and revenue needs. Uh, many companies are talking about uh, <coughs> corporate social responsibility plans and risk management plans, but it seems that the only time that we really focus on risk management is after when we have a disaster like earthquakes in, uh, in Japan or the floods in Thailand. So we don't keep a focus on it. And the CSR program, social responsibility, uh, are kind of weak. Uh, if you go to a corporate website, you'll find that they say that they're out there 100% training and developing their supply chain. They're auditing all the suppliers in the supply chain and they're getting compliance from the supply chain on all the social responsibility, ethics, uh, modern slavery, some other things. Now, I will tell you with the changes in Australia and the UK, uh, there is a, a bigger focus on, on uh, modern slavery, but we still have environmental and we have political issues and all kinds of things that we'll, we'll focus on a little bit later in this. So we, many companies uh, are talking that they have full developed uh, corporate social responsibility programs. They have all of the suppliers trained. They've delivered policies to all of those suppliers. They're training the suppliers every year and they're ordering for compliance. And that, that's, that's really not happening the way it should. And then we, not, we have not made uh, the necessary changes in technology that we need to make. So as we look back, there are things we could have done better. And as we look at what we've done, we've done some pretty good things. Uh, but now we're moving in a different direction because everything is changing on us. We have lots of challenges and opportunities in the supply chain uh, as we start to look at digital disruption. And I can think of lots of digital disruptions uh, that I've seen uh, for anybody that uses Uber. Um, that's, that's amazing because it's changed the entire industry. Uh, very rarely do you use a cab anymore, and I'm so surprised that the taxi cab industry hasn't adopted a model like Uber where they'll come pick you up, deliver you, and take care of you. Um, this virtual reality, uh, there are uh, warehouse, I, you know, I went to see a, um, a presentation the other day on drones, and I was expecting to see delivery drones that everybody's talking about, but that's not what I saw. What I saw were these drones in the warehouse that every, every hour would go up and down the aisles 
would look at all the barcodes, would identify all the inventory. If something got moved and is in the wrong place, the drone would report it. And if something was missing, the drone would report it as well. So we're seeing lots of things that happen all the time. The music industry has changed from, you know, records to uh, cassettes to digital. Uh, the iPhone has changed a lot of things. So we're seeing lots of digital disruption and we'll talk a little bit about it. We're also seeing globalization, but as a result of the pandemic, we're seeing calls for localization. So we'll talk about that a little bit in the, in the mega trends. We also are looking at customers want more value. They want, they want lower price and more value features year on year. And we have to really kind of respond to that, be innovative, help drive those changes so that we keep our customers happy and we maintain our share of business. There's the redefining of industry, and we will talk about this as moving to all connected, uh, connected supply chains and uh, manufacturing 4.0. We'll talk a little bit about that. Well, the future of work, we'll talk about that with social responsibility and, and the four generations in the workforce. We'll also talk about the um, managing the planet and we'll talk about the demographics. So let's go with the first mega trend that I see. The first mega trend is really about digital disruption. And I want to really focus the digital disruption on procurement and manufacturing. So we'll, we'll look at that. You know, disruption is really fundamentally, the, the, the fundamentally changing the way the world works. Today's business and government are all responding to all these changes. There's shifts that I would never have seen coming uh, from a lifetime. I never would have seen a phone on my watch, although people predicted it years ago in cartoons and I never would have seen that coming. So digital disruption kind of messes up the industry and messes up the world. When we start thinking about how will digital disruption impact procurement, um, what's going to happen and is happening is work currently done by humans will be replaced by machines. You know, in the past, we had transactions, planning, all sor and sourcing all done by humans. And in the future, AI and IoT will replace humans. So I had a friend a while ago, and I actually had, he had a vision about artificial, uh, artificial intelligence and how it was going to change procurement. And I actually had him come in and talk to the consultants in my group. And his name was Clive Heal, and Clive was at Genentech as the leader of procurement. And Clive's vision was that an AI computer capable, connected to the internet, would be able to search for all the supply, suppliers around the globe for a given category. The, the uh, AI is a learning machine, so it would draft an RFI. It could potentially build a short list of suppliers based on criteria, and it learns as it goes along, so it gets better as it does more RFIs. And the AI computer would send an RFP, and the AR computer would make a recommendation for who to source with and, and give you the criteria of the recommendation. And I did this at a webinar, kind of like I'm doing now. And a guy named Joe Yokora called me up and said, do you want to see it? They're building it at Sanford University. And I'm more than welcome to introduce you to the professor that's got this AI computer working. That, that was just amazing to me. And so if you think about that, um, a lot of the transactions are done. Now we have bots that, uh, that were able to take uh, PDFs off of, off of invoices coming in and put the invoices in and put it right to the supplier, make the automated payments. You know, all the new systems coming out have bots all over the place doing a lot of work that used to be the work of, uh, of humans. So how would, it, how would an integrated supply chain change the way we work? Well, We'd have the AI search for suppliers and, and make a recommendation. Uh, we would be able to uh, create, uh, uh, tra transmit um, actual customer data so we know what the forecasting is. We can have requirements automatically uh, built by um, planning systems. So if you think about the Internet of Things, the Internet of Things really can drive, uh, uh, can tell you what foods in your refrigerator, tell, my car tells me when I need an oil change or whatever's happening in the car, or if I need air in my tires. So the IoT would be connected in the supply chain. Uh, orders would be released from manufacturing, robots would pick the stock, and logistics would be able to take, a, take it over and drive, uh, drive, um, drive, drive the things uh, with driverless trucks. 
and across the supply chain, transactions would be logged automatically and receipts and payments would be handled by, uh, by blockchain. So some of these things are a little bit far out, but if you think about it, a connected supply chain where you have all those uh, suppliers connected in an integrated system, um, as soon as you see a demand, that demand is going to be driven through IoT down to the lowest level of the supply chain. So you have perfect visibility and forecasting, and then you've got you've got the ability to release orders, make the product on time, and deliver it on time. So it's a little bit of a change and a little bit of a futuristic view of what's going to happen. You know why why do we what's what's going to happen in striving this order automation? Well, what we're seeing is we're seeing a shortage of labor particularly in the US, just before the pandemic, now we've got quite a bit of unemployment. Before the pandemic, we were at, at, at a 3% labor rate. There wasn't enough labor to go around and the labor wasn't in the right places. We have a lot of millennials that choose to work in jobs and choose not to work in things like factories, trades, truck drivers, or other skilled work. Ways, wages are rising, automation offsets low cost labor. We'll stop chasing the globe if people automate their factories and robots don't get sick or tired, and they're willing to work a 24-hour day. The advantages are clearly high productivity, and the disadvantages are the investment you have to make in keeping up with technology. But if you start thinking about the, the factory of the future, this is what the factory of the future would look like. You'd, you'd have you know, automated, integrated systems generating the products. And I found an amazing statistic that I thought I'd share with you. Fornic in Japan has a factory that runs unsupervised for 30 days at a, at a time. Robots build other robots at a rate of 50 per 24 hour shift. The plant's been operating since 2001. So if we think about Megatrain one, Mega, Megatrend 1, we think about the digitalization of the supply chain, the integration of suppliers. We think about how those integrated suppliers are aligned in, in strategy and we also think about how those integrated suppliers uh, are going to work together uh, to increase value and, and distribute profit along the contribution line of what they do. So that's really that. And the, the second megatrend should be no surprise. It's really about how do we do that integration? You know, long term, I've always said, even in the book that I wrote back uh, a while ago, that we're going to have uh, integrated supply chains and they're gonna be competing uh, tied supply chains. And those, those supply chains, if you think about the, the automotive industry, at least in the US, the automotive industry, there's a Japanese industry, there's a Japanese sector, there's a European sector, there's a US domestic sector, uh, and all those, there's a Korean sector, and all those supply chains are really, they're breaking apart and they're servicing each one of those customers. So now you have competing suppliers uh, driving, driving uh, driving together in an integrated system. We're gonna have tied systems with blockchain. Blockchain is gonna work good in some industries and not good in others. Um, one, one of the features is that it can keep track, track of things and it makes a permanent record you cannot change. So that'll help on the accounting side and with certain things like block tracking of food and things like that, it would be, it would be helpful. And then you're gonna have uh, all the businesses linked with IoT technology in the long term. So we've got to, we've got to have uh, integrated supply chains, and then I want to talk about what what will happen, uh, you know, in in procurement. What will what will procurement's role be? And if you think about it, uh, it's really going to be managing those supplier relationships, management managing the alignment of the business plan, and managing um, those, those suppliers uh, to to innovate. Uh, create new things. So there's a guy named Pierre Mitchell, and he works for Spend Matters. And Pierre said something once I found profound. He said that the, the best thing, the hardest, the, the most impactful thing that a buyer can do is do a supplier selection. Because when you do the supplier selection, you're really architecting the supply chain of the future. So supplier selection is going to be critical supplier relationship management, clarity, trust, uh, transparency are all gonna be uh, important as supply chains start to integrate. And then the, the key word for relationship and, and success is agility and flexibility. Uh, if your supply chain is not agile and flexible, 
you you can see some of the uh, the impact with some of the things that are going on today with with the pandemic. So the job that purchase the first job purchase will have is really strategic thinking, really building a process and being able to collaborate collaborate internally and externally across the organization uh, organizations is going to be a critical skill set. Then we're going to have to talk about value management and and value will overtake the priority over cost in the future cost reduction in the future um, and and I have a few examples that I can I can share with you and I'll probably share them right now I mean I work I work with a home builder and in the US people aren't going into the trades so it's harder and harder to find people that will go in and or work but my, my home builder is the third uh, largest home builder in the US and they, they want to save money on nails and roof and lumber and all that stuff. But more importantly, what they have to do is they have to complete the communities that they're building, get a, re, get a return on investment for the land, and, and, and get, the, get the housing done. So in a land where you can't find people to do the job, finding the right crews, finding reliable suppliers, having them go through, finish your buildings, and help you meet your profit plan is more important than a couple, couple cents on a nail. Um, and I also worked with a company called Owens, Illinois, and they, they build, rebuild their, their furnaces every two or three years at a cost of about $15 million for a rebuild. And they can, when they use refractory bricks, and they can probably go and spend, uh, get, get, they can get a reduction of a couple cents per brick, but one of the things that they would be better off doing is innovating with the supplier, paying a little bit more, and getting a year more out of the life of the brick and save a $15 million downtime. So it's just the value is people are starting to think about value uh, and value when you start to look at it is going to be more important than price. I'll give you one more example. In my own career, I traded commodities and the one of, I traded spices around the world. And one of the things that I would do is I would buy a pre-cleaned um, uh, oregano and it was probably 30% more than just a raw oregano. But if I bought the raw oregano, uh, when I cleaned it, the yield would be 50%. So it was much better value to buy the pre-clean and not have any fallout on the line and increase the speed of the line. So that's, that's just some examples of how value will overtake price. So procurement's role is gonna be strategic thinking, collaborating internally and externally, driving suppliers, picking the right suppliers and architecting the chain that's gonna be best for the company and increasing value. Supply chain integration is another thing that we're going to be responsible for, and we're going to have to integrate those suppliers, integrate the systems, and work together. Now, Megatrend 3 should be no surprise either. I really talked about it. It's flexibility and agility, and the needs are constantly changing. So when we start thinking about flexibility and agility, we have to look at what do our customers want? They want speed to market. They want innovation. They want process improvement. They want infinite supply flexibility, shorter life cycles, sustainability, corporate social responsibility, and they want capital investment, specification change, lower cost, more services. And for us to be able to do that, we really have to drive a strategic category plan and business plan that enables us to get our suppliers to give us the innovation, help us get the market faster, give us new specifications, and give us the ideas that we need. We need to make sure that our processes are good so that we, we are flexible and agile. Our products have a shorter life cycle. I know my phone is good for about three years and then I'm buying a new phone because of the changes in technology moving along. So we have shorter life cycles. Uh, as soon as one, one, one product's released, they're working on the next version to come out a year later. So I think that, that that is something that keeps us moving along, keeps us uh, good. And if we're not flexible and agile, we won't, we won't get competitive advantage. We'll lose the race altogether. So what do CEOs want? Well, where'd they go? Those things went away. They, they want uh, so supply chain alignment. They want a supply chain that aligns with our business strategy. So if our business strategy is low cost production, then we have to have suppliers that have that same goal. If it's innovation, then we have to have suppliers that are generating innovation. Speed to market in some cases uh, 
really uh, is a criteria that is, is going to win the race. So if you're in the pharmaceutical industry and you get to market first with a patent, you've got the competitive advantage for 15 years. So that's a driver. I had a, uh, a friend who was in the music business and we were, we were discussing procurement one day and uh, he said to me, my buyers don't get it. They're looking for a cost reduction and they want to use a supplier, you know, a, a, a freight, freight supplier uh, that's, that's not going to get the things we need. He said, I have customers in California and that if I can't deliver in one day, like Amazon delivers in one day, I'm not going to get any more business out of California. I've got to be competitive uh, in the marketplace. So they were focused on price and he was focused on making the logistics, the, the quickest logistics to the, to the customer. And then revenue growth. The expectation of CEOs uh, now and in the future is that you're going to bring in incremental ideas, processes, and, and capabilities that are going to grow the top line. And so that, that's what they want. You know, the, the most flexible uh, and agile supply chains are going to get, get competitive advantage. You know, they're going to be well financed. They're going to be able to deliver just in time. They're going to be able to change rapidly, innovate, collaborate. They're going to be able, as a, as a supply chain, to invest. And they're going to be able to determine the distribution of profits based on the profits based on the contribution they give. You know, example of some flexibility that SIPS has got. Here's, here's SIPS's flexibility as we approach um, COVID-19. So we're changing now to digital classrooms. We've got the ability to simulate the classroom with breakouts, whiteboards, the ability to, you know, help companies meet team and individual needs, hit the learning objectives, and do it from distance learning. And I think the long-term long, long, imp long -term impact on this change, which is driven by the pandemic and the ability to be flexible and agile, is going to be that um, e-learning may be de-emphasized, that you're going to have more of the interactive training where you can ask questions and be part of a classroom and work together from a remote location, and you're going to get better learning absorption. So you know, even an organization like SIPS has to be flexible and agile to meet customer demand. I, I talked about value, not price, and I, I gave you some examples. I think I've listed them here again, but uh, nonetheless, it's very important to understand that uh, procurement has to be focused on value maxim maximization for the foreseeable future. We make a lot of decisions um, to go for uh, price only and lower cost, and those things cost us a, a lot of productivity, and it costs us a lot of revenue in terms of what we could get if we were focused on value. Um, procurement will be um, focused on aligning the supply chain to the future, building a business plan, managing risk across that supply chain. And I gave these examples before because it made sense. Um, so the next mega trend really is corporate social responsibility. And it's gonna be our job to manage um, the planet and really actively pick the suppliers, educate the suppliers, audit the suppliers, and then deliver on corporate social responsibility. I think the problem of, of corporate social responsibility is we like talking about it, but when it comes to putting in the frameworks and the money, it's, uh, it's going to be a difficult decision for management. It does cost money to run a good social responsibility program. So, and I've kind of described what that should be when you educate suppliers, uh, audit the suppliers and then uh, and then get get compliance so I think that's that's the fifth mega trend for procurement now I'm going to group the last six together the ne ne uh, mega trend six is Sharon said I was part of a data analytics group and I am one of the things that's very interesting is how we use data the data is available you know I'm amazed at how the marketing folks in the world use data I can be talking to my wife about a thing I want to buy. And the next thing I know, it's on my Facebook because Siri and Alexa and people like that are listening and they're picking that up and the, market, the marketing people are picking that up and they're using it. We don't have that ability yet in the supply chain, but we will be having to, that's a capability we have to get. And it's a capability we're going to have to have is to be able to sort through that data, 
find these key suppliers, find the, find the people that are going to be the value contributors for our supply chains and bring them on board. But that's, uh, that's a mega trend that will be a focus. We will have in procurement data scientists to be able to look through the data, help us with the data, help find the span. I mean, I've been to organizations as, 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 um, as, as late as uh, last year where they had 25 systems unintegrated. They were going through the general ledger by hand to try and figure out what the spend is. And I think that, that that's gonna be a, a thing we've done in the past and we're gonna get better and better at data analytics. We're gonna to have to. So in your team, you will be seeing data scientists. You will be seeing people that help you manipulate the data. Uh, globalization versus local supply. I can tell you that that's a big, big question right now. We're seeing, uh, some countries like France uh, say that they they want uh, to have everything returned to France domestically and don't want to be in the global marketplace. And we've seen people in the U.S. say things like that. But really, I think what's happening is after the earthquake in Japan and some of the disruption, risk disruption we've had, what we're seeing is that these uh, these a lot of these companies are looking to have duplicate supplies and they want to put a smaller footprints, smaller plants in the markets that they're doing business. So you could temp, temp, you could potentially build a, a duplicate uh, group of supply chains and you've covered off the risk. So I think uh, it's going to be a look, look again at what are we doing? How are we doing it? Where do we want to put things? But it's going to be impacting you, especially after uh, we return to work from COVID-19. Uh, Contingent labor, you know, I, I sat through a, uh, a presentation that Daniel Pink did on contingent labor, and he said that was the way of the future. How will that affect us in purchasing? What I am seeing companies do is I am seeing companies that will be looking to maybe do a steel buy. They'll bring in an expert that's been through it, that understands the steel category, that's driven category strategies in steel. They'll put them in place, have them build a category, have them put a contract in place, and then he can move on to, he or she can move on to another location. Uh, so we're seeing an increase in contingent labors. And if we look at some of the Silicon Valley companies and in the social media space like Google, we're seeing that uh, a big portion of their workforces are contingent. Their uh, contractors come in, do, do a thing or two, and then move on. Uh, the other thing that uh, the mega trend nine is going to be, we really have to look at how the supply chain's financed and what's going to happen. And I'll talk to you in a second about that. And then the last mega trend is what's going to be the use of blockchain in the in the in the supply chain business. I think there are applications now for lot tracking in the U.S. Uh, when you have contaminated food, you know, lots get mixed together and they don't know where they came from. And I think blockchain will be a good application to help help with that lot tracking. And some people believe that uh, blockchain is gonna manage our ledgers and our finances uh, in the future. So those are just uh, five additional trends to think about because they will impact you in your life over the next 10 years. So what, what do we wanna do as we look ahead? Um, well, definitely we wanna get category management right. We wanna have at least three year plans. We wanna look at one year for the short term, uh, two years for the medium term, and three years for what's the long-term strategy. Are we gonna contract the supply base, add the supply base, be strategic with a supplier? All, all those decisions have to be made in a plan. They have to be architect architected, well-written, and then brought to management. <clears throat> uh, we also are gonna redesign the procurement process with the understanding of a business-wide process. We own the process, but we have stakeholders in the indirect side that really own the budget. So we're gonna to have to learn how to work within that, how to be influencers, how to be trusted advisors, and really how to work cross-functionally because everybody has a stake in the business. We've gotta invest in technology. One of the places we fall short is we're living with band-aids on systems when we're moving ahead so fast in a digital age. And if you haven't really brought forward opportunities to invest in technology and make your, and start to get your, even your current affairs in order, uh, and then start to plan for the future, that's something that really has to happen uh, pretty quick. And then I think you have to look at building a total cost of ownership approach for your categories and your supply. And really, you have to, you have to really develop the full supply chain with, you know, with social responsibility and manage succession planning in your business. 
So those are five key strategies. And there are just a couple more that you may want to think about, you know, that you got you to make sure. One of, the, one of the big complaints that I see as I go around the U.S. and I talk to CEOs is that they, they talk about uh, procurement people talking a language of procurish. We talk about RFPs, we talk about proposals, we talk about auctions, but what they want to hear us talk about is growth, finance, you know, um, risk, reward. Uh, those are the things, the things that keep them up at night are how am I going to grow my business? How am I going to get cash for the business? How am I going to get cash to invest? And when we do presentations, we need to be thinking about the language of business when we present to them. And one of the exercises I like to do with groups is I like to play the CEO and have them give me an elevator speech about their projects. And what typically happens is they do the procurish thing and I just say, I hate your project. Come back when you have some business information in it. So you got to start thinking about how, to, how, we, how we present things and how we look. Um, we have to have a good supplier relationship management in the future. It's going to be uh, a need, as we can see through the megatrends. we got to develop individuals and teams, and they have to have back to basics. They have to have the basic toolkits. They have to be able to drive and execute well-planned category strands, plans and negotiation plans. And we need to train procurement leaders to look forward and build new processes, systems, and comprehensive business programs. So that's how I think we have to look at the future. <clears throat> you know, as we, as we come out of the COVID-19 thing, I have some concerns and I'll, I'll share them with you. I think that there are gonna be very, very cash poor suppliers. And you know, in the US, it was pretty, the game for finance uh, organizations and companies was to, let's see how far we can stretch the terms. The worst was automotive at 180 days. Uh, pharmaceutical and some of the retail people were at 120 days. They were actually uh, putting those long terms in and then charging the suppliers interest and lending them the money to pay those terms. I think as the suppliers are cash poor, if you're not gonna have the right terms, um, you're probably not gonna get what you need. I think also that the suppliers uh, are gonna come at you trying to increase margins to make up for some financial losses so if you don't have a cost containment program at the moment, you should think about putting a cost containment program in. I think capacity is going to be a premium. Who's going to get the capacity when we start up? Everybody's going to want everything at one time. And I think if you're, you're the person say, hanging out there saying you don't get paid for four months, you're probably not going to get the capacity. Uh, and you'll be competing with other people in your industry for the capacity. I think relationship is everything. I think you should be working those relationships now. Um, just to make sure that they're all intact. Uh, the switch doesn't turn on all at once, so uh, it's good. it won't bring everybody back to work on this on day one. Uh, some suppliers in the supply chain won't be there anymore, and you really need to have a good handle on who's going out of the supply chain. Are they going to shut you down? Are you going to be able to get what you need? And then, um, and then I think um, our competitors will be aggressive looking for the same materials, and we'll be expected to do more than we ever had before. And I think the focus on risk will be much higher now uh, than ever before. So I think our, our managers will um, really expect risk uh, to be a critical thing. So what I hope I've given you over this short period of time is a little bit about how, how procurement's changing. What are the trends that are gonna change procurement and you, your lifestyle in the future? Uh, what are the strategies you should be thinking about as you move forward? And then um, hopefully, uh, so what, what do you have to do? How do you have to change your team? And how can you help yourself in this environment? And we promised to 15 minutes of questions. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it back. Great, thank you, Bill. An absolutely comprehensive presentation and, um, and very insightful. In fact, so much so, I think um, some of the questions may have already been answered, but let's, let's go. There's quite a few on the board, so thank you everyone for participating. Um, you spoke about the role of procurement and, um, and AI and digitisation, and um, you pretty much outlined that, but let's ask some questions from the audience uh, just to really unpack this. Uh, will AI and digitisation replace procurement? and also what sort of time frame are you seeing it? I think that AI, uh, AI and uh, IoT will, will take away 
the transactional activities and tactical activities that we had. So I think that if you're a person that's look, just looking at pushing POs or invoices or things like that, your time frame is probably five to seven years and you really need to develop skills and, and managing suppliers, working with suppliers and, you know, architecting the supply chain. I think, I, th I think that, you know, if you start looking at why people automate, they automate to get, to get rid of routine jobs and labor. I mean, you go to McDonald's now and you push a button for the food you want, you put your credit card in, someone comes to the counter and finally gives you your food because there's no one at the counter. So I think that was done to, to kind of minimize labor. I think we're, we're gonna see the same thing because those machines can do routine transactions. They can do things to simplify uh, the process. So our job is gonna to be to develop more strategic skills. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Um, in, in this environment of COVID-19, um, how do you think COVID-19 will affect integrated supply chains with the drive to buy local and create challenges in a typically monopolistic relationship? Thanks, yeah, Mike. I, I think that's a great question. I think, I think that um, as we start to think about it, there are pushes for you know, moving, moving to local supply chains. Some supply chains can't do it. So, you know, if you think about uh, the tooling industry where you had these master tool makers over time and the industry moved on to China, it, it's been gone for 20 years. If you try to find tool makers now, they're, they're, they're difficult to find. Or the electronics industry where a company like Apple has invested so much money in the technology in Asia, it's very hard to reinvest and bring it back in a, in a timely fashion to keep the product uh, short product life cycles going. So I think some of that's going to be difficult. I think what we really have to do is look at, you know, what, what will it take? Where's the best place to get this thing? It doesn't make sense to me to have one location somewhere else in the world with all the logistics hassles. And, you know, I, I went to a company and I looked at their, I was analyzing the company. It was a company that uh, was move, was making decisions to move, uh, move things to a, a centralized spot. But I asked them, you know, have you considered duty and freight? Have you considered the fact that when you take this out of the supplier, then the supplier's overhead is going to go up and all your costs and everything else are going to go up? Have you considered uh, the implications of additional stock on the water? Have you done all those calculations? And they looked at me and said, no, we haven't done any of them. We're just looking at the price. Well, yeah, it's all well and good to get that. But if you get a, a load rejected or if you've got an extra 12 weeks of inventory on, in your plant and on the water to be able to cover that kind of thing and you're getting and you're destroying a, a current supplier's overhead costs it's not really good so I think that's going to take a cost calculation we have to be analytical about how we make those decisions and we have to be able to support uh, any decision we make with fact-based data. Right thanks Bill um, and a nice lead into the next question if you can just put your video back on yes we seem to have oh. lost you for a minute. What did I do? Uh, pardon? I'm looking at it. it. Says I'm here. What the heck? Okay. So I'll stop it and then I'll put it back on. Start. It didn't come on. I don't know what's happened. The camera's gone. Okay. We'll we'll um we'll keep moving well, on. There's my pace. There you go. <laughs> um. The next one. Another question. Um. Uh, so many great questions. Thank you. Uh. Due to the impact of COVID-19 and the ongoing, this is uh, from Kudzo Holland, due to the impact of COVID-19 and the ongoing tension in US-China trade, are we going to see, uh, one, a partial reversal or move away from the lean and just-in-time approaches, or two, a preference for the more um, domestication and shorter supply chains, or three, I hope you can see this, Bill, and three, less low-cost country sourcing, particular out of Asia. Thank you. Yeah, well, what I, what I see is that, um, the first thing I, I said, as I said in the presentation, uh, I said, um, the, the Low cost, if, if you automate and you invest in automation, automation offsets low cost labor. So if you're automated, um, the, you know, you can use robots, they're produ productive, they're there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they don't get sick, they don't get tired. So I think that that's one thing that's going to remove uh, um, uh, the chase for low cost labor around the country. We're running out of places to go. The next place to go is Africa. And China is, it was before the uh, pandemic, developing a middle class and all of its costs were rising. 
So, you know, you're going to have to find a new place to go. And, and sooner or later, we're going to run out of places to go. Uh, but I do think that it's very important that we, um, we look at what are we doing, where are we doing it, and then, you know, what's the best sourcing. We're also going to see a lot of, uh, I think, a lot of moves for um, in-house, going back to uh, make or buy. There's going to be some make or buy decisions on some of these things. Um, but I think, I think it's going to be more about uh, where's, where's the right place to put it? Should we have multiple footprints? I know there's a move for we need more domestic, but in some cases, the industries just can't move. Thank you. Uh, another question uh, about agree about value management, but how do we define value management when you have such a wide stakeholder base, e.g. value is in the eye of the beholder, so finding consensus is key? I think you have to really look at the business strategy. So I talked about the home builder and what they realize is that if they don't find the right crews and, and they have to, sometimes they have to balance and pay a little bit more, then they're not going to meet their business objective and close their, close their profit plan for the year. And uh, so I think, I think you have to understand what is they And they, all, they do want to save money on components, but it's more important to get the job done and get a return on investment for the land. Uh, I do, do also think that, uh, management doesn't understand the value base yet. I think it's a, it's a hard drive for management because what they want to see is they want to see price reductions and they want to focus on the short term and the value piece is going to be uh, focused on the long term. It's going to be better productivity, uh, quicker things, and maybe, maybe more strategic alliances in some cases uh, in, in where, you know, in one, one case I had, it was more effective to have a single source supplier uh, and let them build a plant on top of our plant so that we wouldn't have any freight and we'd have control over the components and it gave them a distribution pace for somewhere else. So I think you have to look at each case and you have to build what, what is the best strategic value for this and you have to actually sell that to management. Uh, in the case of Alcan, I talked about Alcan because that's where I worked, or I talked to Sharon about it. It's where I worked when I was in Gold. One of the things we had to do was uh, they had to build a, a uh, category plan that showed that they were going to run out of uh, um, calcine, co cal calcine coke and, and they, they built a category management plan with all their data showing what the market would be, what it was then, what it would be 10 years from now and what would happen to the capacity and they put in a proposal for a $150 million plant and got it because the supply base was shrinking. So I think, I think every case has to be looked at you have to look at what's a business strategy. You have to be aligned with the business strategy at the top level. And then you have to have a supply chain that supports that business strategy. Thank you. Um, it looks like we've lost your, your on screen again, Bill. Um, <laughs> uh, what's your take on procurement's evolving role in innovation and creating visibility and transparency? I think it's a vital role. I think it's, it's a requirement in some companies that uh, the supply base comes in with innovation. And that innovation can be uh, better specifications, higher productivity. Um, it could be change in, change in design. It could be recommendations to help, uh, help companies. In, in my own career, I, I, had, uh, uh, I was in the food business and we were looking for tamper evidence. And we had a supplier come in with um, uh, tamper. It, we, I was in the, in, in, it was pickles with the button caps. They were vacuum buttons, but they weren't tamper evident because anybody could open them up, throw some nasty stuff in, put them in a the microwave, put the cap back on, the vacuum would draw the top down again. So uh, we had one company that came in and they, they came in before they got the patent and showed us that they could put a coating on it with a pigment in it. And as soon as that cap broke, it would change to red and say open. Uh, and, and so you, you can get suppliers to give you innovation. That's going to give you competitive advantage in the marketplace, but that's got to be a requirement when you make your contract that you expect them to come in with, you know, at least three ideas a, a quarter or, or three ideas a year or whatever to drive innovation and change our product. And then from that, you can get a short period of exclusivity, but I think it's a requirement on all suppliers that they bring in uh, innovation. And I think, I think it's got to be a, a business culture. Now, with many, many stakeholders um, getting that value, um, some of them will understand it and some won't. It's like the same with people that are focused on price in the EA short term. They, they won't understand the value of, of um, getting that, getting the value piece. My management on the, uh, uh, on the spice, they couldn't understand that I would pay a premium price for, for the product. But then when you lay out the, 
the waste that you get, we had, we would have had, I, I can't remember the numbers, but it was a significantly heavier cost if I'd have bought, bought that and thrown away half the product. Thank you. Um, so many great questions. I'm not sure, folks, that we're going to get through them all because Bill, Bill's doing a champion effort here. Um, just one, do you have any thoughts on how emerging marketers supplier, market suppliers can recover from COVID? That's an interesting question. I, I don't I don't really know that because, you know, I don't even know how we're going to recover from COVID at the moment or anybody. I know that we've got we've got a lot of disruption. We've got idle businesses. We got a crash in the economy. And uh, I don't know what it's going to take to get that all back together. Sure, sure. And also thinking about our, our soft skills, how will digital mega trends affect the future of negotiation and soft skills associated with procurement? Well, I think I think the soft skills for relationship management and influence are going to be critical. You've got to be able to influence stakeholders uh, to to understand a different different dynamic, a different plan, and work with you a different way. Uh, in negotiation, I think we have to get we have to learn how to uh, uh, how, how to deal with the digital side when we're more and more negotiations are focused on the e-learning side. I do know one thing is when you when you're doing your digital negotiation. Um, you know, on email, you got to show some humanity. If you don't show, if you just ask for a price or whatever, this is something that changed my life. It was a, it was a study that Patricia Wallace did in the Harvard Business uh, School. She said, if you don't have warm, uh, a warm and human look, like, you know, hope you had a good weekend or just something that makes you human, uh, you'll get a better deal. You'll be seen as trustworthy uh, and, and uh, warm. If you are very cold and just ask for a price and just do this, then you're going to be seen as cold and manipulative. So we got to learn how to how to play the digital game. Uh, but I do think you, the the soft skills are critical. The soft skills in negotiation are critical. You know, I, I have people come to me and say they want to do a, a negotiation course online, and I always try not to do that because. Um, I, don't, I think you have to have the face-to-face. -face. You have to look at the body language. You have to know the eye, you look at eye contact, body language. You have to know the tactics. You have to really match up you know, your uh, BATNA and your uh, zone of purchasing agreement. You have to have all that aligned. And, and I think it's a, it, it, our, our job, really the strategic side of the job is a people job and a soft skill job. And whether you're working internally or externally, you got to build trustworthy relationships. If you're internal and you're in indirect, you got to be the trusted advisor that they want to go to to get information and get things. And uh, and even when you're with the supplier, you got to be a, a trusted person in order to get them to do things that you want them to do, which may not be things they do for anybody else. Uh, and one, I can give you one quick example of that. We were we use and this is where you use data and relationship. Um, we were working on caustic for uh, for Alcan in, in Gove, and uh, we did a competitive bid, but we asked for all this unique innovation in the bid. We asked them to give us all the, all the prices and all the types of markets that they could have and everything. And one of the suppliers came back with, they would, they would allow Alcan to set 30% of the price on the London uh, Metal Exchange um, for aluminum. And, and with the logic that when aluminum goes up, they, they have the ability to pay more. When it goes down, they don't. And, and you know, so that was, that's not even a chemical or a component or a part of the cost, but they agreed to that because of the soft skills and because of the argument we put forward and uh, because of the relationship. So I think that's going to be important. I think the relationships are going to be really important coming out of COVID-19 uh, if you need materials. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, just maybe a closing sentence that you offer to all the procurement professionals out there, Bill, um, as we close off and keep to our time today. Well, I think that the, the one thing that I would offer is that, you know, you really want to, you want to move into a more strategic position. You want to really think through not only this year, but next year and the following year, how are you going to move that category? How are you going to drive it? How are you going to get the innovation? How are you going to get the integration? You know, what kind of relationship do you want with the supplier? Do you want a strategic relationship and you have to define that? Or do you want a tactical relationship and, and, uh, and stay in leverage? But those things all have to be thought through and you really need a good plan to do it. And the other thing I'd say is right now, a map of the supply chain would be very helpful to try to figure out who's in it and where you are now in terms of your components.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. And thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. Really special thanks to, to Bill for his insights, his experience and his knowledge and, and you know, speedily going through answering me as many questions as he possibly could. Uh, also, I want to say a special thanks to the SIPSA Tech events team, Giovanni and Sophia, a great job on all the webinars, but this one particularly has been terrific. To all our attendees, we hope you found the web webinar insightful. Uh, before you leave today, please make sure you complete our post-event, uh, post-webinar, I should say, uh, survey and help us uh, with feedback to, so we can improve the next one. Don't forget the member offer and also a copy of the webinar and a list of the unanswered questions will be emailed um, to each of you tomorrow. So that's just to note. And I'd also like to make note that we have another webinar on Wednesday the 29th of April at 12 noon Eastern Australian Eastern Standard Time and it's on best value procurement model, an alternative approach. So check out our website for more details there. Continue to practice social distancing. We're playing a collective effort here to flatten that curve and to, recall, and to tackle the coronavirus. Please stay safe, be well, and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.